So my dissertation is in evolutionary biology. And within this field, there are many, many different facets. But what I am most interested in is broad scale evolutionary biology. What factors throughout an ecosystem or an environment presently and historically have resulted in the formation or the persistence of different species. So broadly, diversification is the process by which an organism is able to become genetically distinct from others and become new species or become genetically distinct but still remain the same species potentially in a new area. Um, what this represents right here is what is called a phylogenetic tree and that is essentially the crux of evolutionary biology. So what you have is with each of these branches, you have the formation of new species or new lineages of species. And there's multiple different factors that are responsible for giving rise to new genetic diversity. Uh, but one of the key drivers that is long recognized in evolutionary biology is geographic isolation. So if you have one lineage of a species separated from the same species by a mountain range, over time, all things keeping consistent, it's likely that random genetic mutations are going to cause these species to become different over time. And as we have the forests and deserts and savannas and different habitats throughout the world, they haven't always persisted as they are today. There's been continuous change happening, and all of this continuous change is reflected in the organism's DNA. So, my obviously my research takes place in Guyana, but I've always been personally attracted to the neotropics, and that's the region that is outlined here in green from upwards of Central America all the way down here to covering about three quarters of South America. One of the things that this region in particular is known for is the biodiversity levels are unbelievably high, but still, despite years and years of research, the specific factors that have given rise to all of these different species is still not fully understood. So specifically, the Canuco Mountains, which is this region down here, has been the main focus of what I've been attempting to do for my dissertation. Um, as you can see with this map here, which is a subset of the map that I showed previously, the Canucus are geographically isolated from both the Pacaraimas as well as the Acarais down to the south. And it has been this way for upwards of two billion years. So I want to know how this long-term isolation and persistence of this mountain chain has affected the subsequent diversification of specifically the reptiles and amphibians that live within. And also to see if there are specific geographical factors, again, the Rupununi savanna separating from the Pacaraimas and the Acarais, or certain timing events, whether there has been an influence of different glacial maximum throughout time, and how that has affected species moving in and out and being able to migrate and reproduce with the same organisms in different areas of the Guyana Shield. Now, it's important when using a phylogeographic approach to consider different life history traits of a species. Obviously, something like a frog is going to be able to travel less easily than something like a bird or a bat. So that would then result in a different evolutionary history than uh, you know, one versus the other. So. What I am using, again, for my research is reptiles and amphibians, and I'm making it a point to use a variety of reptiles and amphibians. Not all frogs live on the ground. Not all snakes live on the ground. So I'm using a variety of frogs, a few tree frogs, as well as a few ground-dwelling frogs that both differ in their reproductive modes. Some of these frogs lay eggs in moist areas under logs and that go, undergo what is called direct development or hatch into tiny froglets directly from the eggs. 
as opposed to other species that lay their eggs in the water of rivers. And if there's flooding events, naturally these tadpoles are going to be able to spread much further. So it's important to consider the different factors of each of these species when, when considering what you want to use to study this and what kind of claims you're attempting to make. And then likewise with the reptiles and amphibians, I'll be, or the reptiles rather, I'll be using a terrestrial snake, uh, the labaria, just due to how common they are, um, the yellow-footed tortoise, which is a commonly found species in forest environments, as well as two different lizards, one that lives on the ground and one that lives in the trees. So all of these differ in their ability to move across an environment, so their vigility, their thermal tolerance. You wouldn't expect a frog to be able to come out of the rainforest in the canucus and travel across the dry Rupununi savanna to get to other rainforests. So keeping that in mind, having all of these different species and examining the same thing, I'll be able to see if there have historically been specific factors that have affected all of them at the same time. And then will allow you to make broader claims about what exactly has happened in the past to affect the evolutionary trajectory of these species. And if there are similar timing events, then you would expect in all likelihood that it to have impacted all of the species that, have lived, that live within this environment. So with doing this, whenever I'm in the field, I have to collect tissue samples from my species. So I'm, I'm, all of this is done with DNA analysis in the lab. Um, and I'm using a variety of different mitochondrial and nuclear markers um, so with each of these, I'll take a piece of tissue, whether it's if I make a specimen out of it, I take a sample of the liver. Um, otherwise, I'll take a piece of the tail, a toe, pretty much any type of tissue that I know if I'm keeping the animal alive won't impact its survival, but will allow me to get all of the genetic information I need to put through the rigorous analyses to make these claims that I'm trying to. Um, and then with this, I will be able to generate phylogenetic trees or trees that show the relationships within and among species that I'm using for my study. Um, and again, this is the same tree that we saw before, but it just kind of goes to show, you know, say for example with the Kanukus, this, this lineage right here might be a frog that is found on the eastern side of the Kanuku Mountains, whereas this over here might be the lineage on the west side and enough time has passed that they've been separated that they have been able to, while they're still the same species, evolve enough genetic difference to show that they're on a different trajectory and they might well, thousands of years from now, become their own distinct species. In addition to this, um, I will also be generating what are called species distribution models. So these are two examples down here, which I'll touch on in a second. but. With the data we have available today, I can generate these models going 21,000 years ago to present day to future climatic scenarios, um, 21,000 years ago being what is recognized as the last glacial maximum. And we'll be able to basically see how things have changed over time and will change, what suitable habitat existed where. So you basically take a series of GPS coordinates from where you found these organisms and you know that they exist. And it will take all of the environmental factors, whether it's precipitation, altitude, temperature, as it relates to the presence of this species and model whether or where it might exist presently or where it has previously existed and with what is expected to happen with global climate change what we might expect to change in their own habitat and affecting their distribution. And with this, combined with my phylogenetic trees that I generate, we'll be able to test different diversification hypotheses that have affected these distributions of all these species. So this species distribution map down here, now these don't represent any particular species in general. These are just, I pulled out a series of rough GPS points and plugged them in. But what you can see here the yellow, the colors that are yellow and orange are greater concentration of the species, as especially you see on this map, whereas the blues and lighter, um, like cyan color, 
they're less likely to occur there. So a map like this shows that this organism at this time is widespread throughout the Guyana Shield. Whereas this map to the right here, you have these narrow pockets where these organisms are, and you can see it's a much more fragmented population throughout the Guyana Shield. 